you know, migrating all over the place. Uh, we went to many, many, many states, uh, and we would always go home to Texas in, for, for Christmas. Basically, December was the winter months. That's when nothing was happening. Everything was frozen. And uh, eventually, at one point, uh, everything that happens to a family, is it was just like so... Uh, uh, your destiny was, you know, would change every day. It, it, there was no planning for the future. There was no planning for college or anything like that. It was just a matter of trying to exist from day to day. So the existence of migrant people is from day to day. And their success is based on how well they get along with each other, what kind of, um, what kind of understanding they have with the people, because it's, it's not only one family, but several families that you travel together, that you have a set of rules, of ethics, uh, fairness, whatever. And so uh, based on that, uh, we travel everywhere. And yeah, there was times when somebody didn't get paid or something like that, or the, the conditions were so poor. The, uh, the labor camps in Minnesota, for example, in the north, they were very nice. Um, they were better than our house back home, you know, because our house back home had a dirt floor uh, part of it, that the kitchen had a dirt floor, and then the, the bedroom where we all slept in, it was, it's a two-room house, by the way, so um, that had like a, a wood made out of, a, a wood floor, but it was made out of planks that had like the the knots on the wood, they were knocked out and some, so you're always like uh, at the, at the <coughs> uh, in peril of the uh, scorpions and whatever came out of the little holes there, and but uh, but basically, uh, we we were the migrant experience, and and uh, I remember working uh, next to Braceros, which was a program that brought me Mexicanos over uh, from Mexico legally to work in the United States, um, and uh, conditions like in in camps in Arizona, they were awful. I mean. Uh, I wrote a song for my brother, uh, and it tells about when he died. And it was a time when lo lots of migrant kids died in that year. Uh, and uh, yeah, they got sick. Uh, I I don't exactly know what it was, but it was some kind of a plague. And it and of course, if if you were living in terrible conditions to begin with, or well, you're pretty susceptible to getting all these diseases. And so my, my sister's firstborn died and my brother died uh, during that epidemic in, in a course of about three days. And it, it hit fast and hard. And it was in the, um, in the fall of 1952. And so I wrote a song for those migrant kids. And it's, uh, <laughs> I'm not making a plug for my CD, but it's in the CD. And uh, what happened is that those are the kind of things that... Uh, that needed to be addressed. And, and the point that I was trying to make was that, that what made migrant uh, successful, if you can say success being a migrant family, was to stick together, to depend on each other, to trust each other, um, to take care of each other. Um, and pretty much you were on your own out there. But the bigger your family was, the better. But the minute that you start losing members of the family, either because they got married or state stayed in a particular state, they, they, were gonna, they got a job, for example, or whatever, and you continue to migrate on and your family becomes smaller. Then it, it, we had to find something different because our family had grown. Uh, there was only uh, some of us left, and only my father and my mom were the adults working, and my sister was 15. She was the eldest of the family, and all my older ones had gotten married. So we went to California, and, and, uh, and we ended up, running out of money in Gilroy, California. And uh, we stayed there three days, uh, we, and all we were eating was bologna and bread. It was kind of like a, I mean, my father was always like uh, trying things out. He was kind of like the pioneer. He's the one that led the families. He was kind of like the, when we went, uh, my mother's uh, brothers and sisters, uh, family related to him, cousins and everything, they would follow him. and. We, we would just kind of stick together. And he was kind of like the um, unappointed leader. I mean, he just kind of 
took over and that was it. And so people really respected what he said or what, and, um, and so I always thought my father was like Captain Kirk because, you know, we would always, he would always go where, you know, where no, uh, migrants had been before and certainly not people from Tejanos, you know, at least from what our knowledge. And, uh, I guess when he took off, I mean, he, he knew a little bit of English, but not very much. And, uh, so, you know, without having like the uh, the navigation system that we have in cars now, you know, where you just look things up. In those days, if you were lost, you had to ask for directions. And how would you ask for directions if you don't know the language? So somehow or another, he figured it out. And we would end up getting to where we were going. And um, And the thing about it was it was just like venturing into the unknown, you know. And it's like I was saying, in Captain Kirk, he would always knew that he was going to face aliens, you know, wherever he went, you know, and heaven knows what they were going to do. They were going to try to get rid of him or do something. But in my father's, uh, I, I imagine that his point of view is like uh, he had no idea that they that where we went, they thought we were the aliens, you know, and uh, and that they had to do something about us. And eventually, that's what's still going on. It's amazing that from those days till today, uh, where you read about, uh, for example, CEOs who make all kinds of bucks, compared to the amount that has been increased in the wages of the migrants, it's been very little comparison to today. It certainly hasn't kept up with the cost of living. You know.